The global economic outlook continues to be bleak. Financial conditions are tightening and recession fears are mounting. Inflation continues to persist at alarmingly high levels across jurisdictions. Now we are in the midst of a third major shock, a storm arising from aggressive monetary policy actions and even more aggressive communication. The MPC also decided by a majority of five out of six members to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation remains within the target going forward while supporting growth. Without venturing into any forward guidance which can be hazardous in the present context, I would like to state that our actions will be carefully calibrated to the incoming data and the evolving scenario. It was an entirely predictable 50 basis rate hike from the Reserve Banks. Normally, a 50 basis hike would have raised heckles in the market and in political circles. But stock markets actually cheered with a near 2% rally, especially for the Nifty Bank. So shocking has been the currency market and the global turmoil that anything less than 50 may have actually been a risk both for markets and for the economy. But now the question is, what next? The governor absolutely and resolutely refused to give any guidance as you just heard from him. So how many more rate hikes? Are we anywhere close to the peak? Also, are the GDP forecasts of 7% slightly lowered and the CPI forecast of 6.7% for the full year, 58 by end of the year, all of them, are they realistic? More importantly, what is the impact on the real economy? For all these questions, I have an elite panel with me. I have with me no less the chairman of the State Bank of India, Mr. Dinesh Khara. Also with me, Mr. B. Prasanna, head of Global Markets Group at ICICI Bank, Samiran Chakraborty, chief economist for India uh, at City, and Ridul Sagar, former member of the MPC and uh, Reserve Bank uh, uh, ED, uh, now an economist with the NCAER. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I could not have asked for more informed people to guide us about the future of the policy and its impact. Uh, Mr. Karas, straight away to you, and thank you very much for joining all the way from London. Uh, so what is the sense you are getting? This is half a percent is quite a bit, and most of the uh, uh, loans are being taken by retail uh, uh, credit in your own bank, more so for other banks. Uh, do you think at this level we might see a slowing of the pace of uh, loan growth? Well, Lata, of course, uh, the first reaction could be what you just mentioned. The pace of the loan growth might slow down. But I would like to go a little deeper and would like to draw your attention to the fact that we have already seen about 140 basis point increase in the repo rate for in, in, in the current year itself. And we have actually seen that the growth has, uh, as far as the banking uh, loan book from the banks are concerned, it is witnessing a very healthy growth, almost as, as high as about 16% plus. So I think uh, what you mentioned in terms of 50 basis point, perhaps it was almost factored in by um, all the participants of the market. And ever since the 75 basis point hike was announced by the Fed, uh, we were all expecting that it is going to be 50 basis point. So to that extent, it was not a shock uh, in terms of expectation. But yes, of course, uh, your Second question mm. relating to will it have an impact on the the, the borrowing from the uh, from the small guy from banking? Yeah, yeah uh, I I think it will not have a very significant impact. I just did some bit of a back of envelope calculation in terms of EMI and its impact, mm. and could figure out that you know overall the EMI impact on the EMI is somewhere. Uh, it is somewhere between 3 to 4 percent of the EMI amount. Okay. So I think, uh, to my mind, uh, it should not be a dampener because so long as the demand is strong in the market, and all of us have seen mm. uh, that last about uh, two quarters onwards, mm. uh, we are seeing a very healthy demand trends. Okay. So I think, uh, though momentarily it might impact, but eventually the decisions taken when people come for the borrowing are generally okay. having a long-term perspective in mind. Okay. And we're all aware that, you know, this kind of a, uh, though uh, Honorable Governor has also indicated that the growth is going to be little slow, but I would say that it is still better than 
many other countries across the across the globe and mm. it is still a very healthy growth trend which is expected to really emerge okay and india continues to be uh, the shining star prasanna uh, do you think uh, now it has to be even doubt uh, now uh, deposit rates are definitely going to rise at least as much as lending rates no on uh, so uh, lata yeah uh, i can give my views uh, i will give it as a market analyst and talk about the general banking system lata so it's nothing <laughs> yes, to do yes, about general, uh, not my ICS, specific yeah. bank yeah yeah so uh, i think i would also tend to agree with most, uh, what mr kara was saying you have to remember one thing uh, lata mm. i think uh, uh, what has happened so far is that the increase in repo has translated uh, to a large extent to uh, the increase in uh, the wholesale deposit rates commercial depo- uh, the cd issuances by banks and so on and so forth but what has not really impacted so far is the retail deposit rates like you rightly pointed out mm. but also bear in mind that the retail deposit rates for the banking system overall would be only around say 40% of the overall cost of uh, overall uh, funding profile of the banking system so uh, even if for example a 100 basis point increase were to happen in the retail deposit rates even if mm. then uh, since uh, the, uh, uh, the the deposit mix is oh. to uh, talk about the increase in rates is going to be going to be to the extent of 40 45 basis points on the overall cost of funds okay. because bear in mind that the casa rates don't change Mm. uh broadly and also bear in mind that the wholesale deposit rates and the cds have actually changed already okay. so to some extent it's the catching up of the retail deposit rates with the uh, change in the uh, rest of the interbank uh, products uh, so mm. to speak but it is not really a one on one comparison that you can do with the deposit rates and the lending rates mm. because of the funding mix of uh, the various banks okay fair enough uh, you know the more pressing problem is how many more hikes now uh, on that uh, uh, you know mridul sagar your views uh, we uh, do you think we have to go sizably into real rates from here on since growth is not that badly off so where would you place uh, the real rate peak so uh, lata i i would say there's still some catch up to do for the rbi um, so some more rate hikes are possible and uh, should be undertaken i mean uh, the terminal rate as i had put up uh, way back in june uh, should be round about 6 and 1/2 or so uh, i had mentioned that uh, abi would become data dependent once the uh, rates cross at 6% the policy rates so it's very much evolving around that line and uh, the problem is that the real deposit rates still haven't gone into uh, positive territory so i i think uh, uh, from the banker's point of view uh, i think it is important that uh, deposit rates have to go up from here we we should get out of the financial repression regime where deposit rates are still negative and uh, that will bring about the right balance uh, also in the sense uh, that uh, even with some lower names uh, the from the economy point of view i think it is very important that those rates uh, rise from here uh, samiran your reaction actually i was going to come to you with uh, that as well the, uh, are you confident of reserve banks uh, 5.8% in the fourth quarter and uh, as well uh, do you agree that uh, rates have much more to move uh, 60 basis more as uh, uh, amrudul sagar is saying so let's have uh, today we have learned uh, two things from uh, the rbi statement one thing is that uh, rbi is uh, quite closely uh, watching the global uh, central bank tightening and the negative uh, spillover effect of that in india and the second thing that rbi has quite clearly uh, mentioned is that the policy is still accommodative and not reached the neutral point by defining that stance in terms of real rates rather than just in terms of nominal rates Uh, now both these things will point towards more rate hikes uh, in the in the horizon uh, we think 6 and 1/2 is uh, quite a possibility uh, if it is done in two stages then uh, that will be in december and february and if our view is correct that fed is also stopping somewhere around march then maybe uh, that will coincide with more or less when uh, fed is also uh, pivoting uh, but uh, the bigger question actually is that whether 
uh, the policy rates can stay at that peak rate okay. for a prolonged period? Uh, or would we see a more uh, quicker hike and cut cycle uh, this time around? And our sense is that we will not be surprised if second half of 2023, we start seeing a rate easing also happening because at this moment, it appears to us that the growth forecasts of RBI are a bit too optimistic, at least for next year. Whereas the inflation forecast for this year is quite realistic. Mm. Uh, but for next year, uh, there is a possibility that RBI can follow what in economist parlance we call opportunistic disinflation, where when inflation comes around uh, the, below the target range, then the RBI can promote growth a little bit more mm. than what they are doing on the inflation front. Oh, that's important. So they can cut uh, even before it goes to four, uh, even if it goes to five, uh, RBI can start cutting. Now, this may sound like jubilation to those of, uh, to viewers who are listening, but the subtext of that is growth needs help. RBI's six and a half percent forecast uh, for next year seems under threat is what Samaran is telling us. We'll scratch that point a little more with our bankers in a minute after this break. Welcome back to our monetary policy special. I have been speaking with perhaps uh, the most elite of uh, panelists. I have with me SBI Chairman Mr. Khara, uh, Prasanna, B. Prasanna, uh, the head of global markets at ICICI, Somran Chakravarti, Chief Economist at City, and Rudul Sagar, former MPC member and uh, ex RBI ED. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, Mr. Khara, I know I can't hold your patience for much longer. Two very quick questions. Would you worry a little bit about the CapEx cycle? Are you, uh, you know, there are growth uh, clouds more than interest rate clouds. Uh, your thought on that? Well, I think uh, uh, it might have some momentary effect, but uh, nevertheless, uh, when it comes to uh, the investment CapEx cycle, uh, we have generally seen that once the capacity utilization inch towards 75 to 80%, uh, there is a very clear visibility in terms of the investment expenditure. And if we look at uh, the 140 basis point of the increase in interest rate has already happened in the current year, but we have got a strong pipeline, which is still seen. And interestingly, almost about 70% of that pipeline is coming from the private sector. So that very clearly augurs well in terms of the likely scenario in terms of uh, as far well as the investment expenditure is concerned. And another quick so I question. Think, uh, yeah. I got your point. Yeah, so another quick clear. question before I let you go. Uh, this is not connected to policy, but uh, there is an expected loss, uh, credit loss uh, uh, discussion paper that is coming. So we will go towards INDAS. Uh, does that worry you if INDAS is imposed, say, uh, uh, FI 25? I don't see it in FI 24 if it is only a discussion paper now. But uh, you think uh, banking system is good to go for INDAS? I think if we look at the kind of uh, uh, gross NPA and, that N uh, and the net NPA which is there in the system today and the and the kind of PCR which the banking system is holding today, perhaps it is the right opportunity and right and opportune time to really evaluate our migration towards NDS. It might have an impact uh, when it comes to the stage one and stage two, okay. but even stage three also, uh, there would be a, a re recalibration which will happen. Mm. And I think it is a, it's a welcome step which RBI has initiated today in terms of uh, going for a discussion paper on the subject. Oh. It might have some impact for the provisioning, but I think eventually it will be in the overall good mm. in the long term. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kara. Really kind of you to spare time for uh, me all the way from London. Uh, we are we have to now discuss what it immediately means to the market. Uh, this this is a discussion paper, and maybe a year down the line, uh, banks have to provide more, but we don't have to worry about it now. Uh, Prasanna, I wanted more your thoughts on where do you see the ten-year peak, the one-year OIS, and more importantly, rupee. Uh, do you think the threat is over for now? Uh, so, Lata, on the bonds, uh, very quickly, I think. Uh, 
uh, we are back to the, uh, the to the grind, so to speak, with the global environment uh, being bearish. We've seen this policy, which has come on expected lines, and we've seen the governor uh, uh, kind of tick all the right boxes, very calming influence. So we've seen that behind us now. But now we'll have to again look at what's going to happen uh, in the U.S. as well as in the U.K. as well as what's happening to the bonds there. And uh, what has actually happened over the last month or two is the Indian bond deals have not really, uh, I would say, reacted as much as what it might have had, uh, basically because of the expectations on the global bond index inclusion. And a lot of uh, discussion has already happened under that, so I don't want to really, uh, you know, extend my arguments on that. But just to say that if the inclusion does happen and the announcement happens next week, then you would see, uh, you know, bond deals falling by around 15 basis points. And on the other hand, if it doesn't happen, we'll probably see... Uh, the borrowing program grinding bond deals uh, gradually going up. And the other thing which is affecting the bond deal curve is, of course, the uh, heightened uh, uh, liquidity shortage that uh, you were talking about uh, uh, in the sense that uh, now the interbank rates are tracking MSF rates and not really the reverse repo rate as was the case nearly a year ago. And so to that extent, there is a natural grind up in terms of uh, where uh, bond deals are. So uh, and also to add to that, the fact that the SDL supply is also now coming in, going to hit the market in the second yes. half. So all in all, I think uh, I would uh, call uh, a range of around uh, 735 to 760 if nothing happens on the global bond index. Okay. And I'm also capping it at 760 primarily because I do see a lot of uh, insurance-driven mm. bank, uh, 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 HTM-driven buying, which is happening when uh, uh, really yields go up. Cool. On the currency side, uh, Lata, I think, again, uh, over the last uh, uh, two to three weeks, especially post-CPI, it's really been dollar strength all the way because the interest rate uh, expectations on the Fed has really got repriced in the global markets and during that period we've seen the dollar appreciating against all the uh, you know the g7 currencies uh, quite substantially and dinar has also you know kind of fallen prey much less though uh, than what the others are uh, so having said that, I do think that the period of dollar bullishness is still going to remain globally. But on the other hand, I will also say that incrementally there are, you know, more and more uh, uh, reasons to be less bearish on the INR uh, beyond this level. Maybe a level of 82 half is what possibly it can go. And uh, I'm basing myself on the fact that the dollar strength can actually start to wane okay. as we go forward. Because the arguments of differential interest rates, differential growth and differential safe haven demand, which is what has driven the dollar so far will probably, uh, you know, kind of get less and less okay. important uh, as we go forward. Well, uh, since we have a city economist with us, uh, that question to you, uh, Sabiran. Uh, you know, there was a similar uh, mood shift in the currency today, not entirely due to the monetary policy as much as the dollar peaking off. Uh, is 83 on the cards or is 82 likely to be, uh, you know, for some time? So with our global uh, uh, strategists, they believe that uh, there is still some uh, dollar strength left in the system. And that's why uh, we are in the short term thinking of even 83 happening. Uh, but this could be a very uh, orderly move in the currency markets uh, rather than uh, being knee-jerk in nature. Uh, we, at least at this point of time, feel that the worst of balance of payment uh, situation is behind us. Uh, second half, both the current account deficit as well as overall BOP uh, should look slightly better, giving RBI a bit more wiggle room to operate with. Uh, and on top of it, as the governor has mentioned today, that a large part of the FX reserve decline is on the back of uh, valuation adjustments and not directly interventions. So these valuation adjustments can work on the other side also, if what uh, Prasanna was referring to, mm. if for some reason the Fed pivots and yields come off, uh, then that automatically leads to our FX reserves optically looking higher. And the same can happen if the dollar cycle turns at some point of time over the next six months or so. Mm. So all in all, I, I feel less worried on that front of oh. RBI's ability to defend the currency. Okay, that's uh, very welcome uh, if you think you are slightly less worried. Uh, Mridul, the most important question to you really is how will uh, the Reserve Bank look at that 4% target or rather the MPC? Uh, you know, go, they have to write this uh, letter to Parliament uh, defending their inability to bring uh, interest rates below 6% for three quarters. It's going to perhaps remain above 6 as you yourself said, uh, for one more quarter. Uh, you know, will they not attempt 4% uh, uh, at all? Is four to six going to be their target? Yeah, um, 
Uh, Lata, if you allow me, let me first quickly react to the discussion which was going on before sure. uh, this thing. In my view, there's the global financial markets are still into choppy waters. I mean, it's too early to sort of say the Fed has peaked. Uh, you know, Barry Eichengreen and INSEAD took the call of 5% terminal rate for the Fed. We still sort of believe that. And uh, there is still uh, on the currency market, so much is happening. I mean, uh, you look at the yen dollar volatility. I mean, from uh, the fall, it's back to 145, 144 levels uh, after the uh, uh, Jackson Hole speech of uh, Powell. Uh, so dollar strengthening is something we can't really say is over. I mean, uh, we, we still have to wait and watch how uh, this pans out uh, in, in, in terms of it. And I think the EM currencies will still need to bear some, some sort of a onslaught uh, in the coming period. Uh, equity markets correction is also not over in, in my view. You, you know, um, there's some work which has come from the Chicago University uh, earlier this month, which shows that the investor habit formation is such uh, that we, we could see a, a, sh a short term interest rate uh, rise with lower output and consumption levels, uh, but will raise risk aversion and amplify the global shock. Okay. So the house price bubbles could burst in places, uh, Australia being uh, one of the immediate. Uh, evidence of it. Oh. Uh, so I think we need to be very trained and very nimble and flexible put it as the governor had really explained oh. in uh, speech also. So at the moment, 4% uh, may not be the immediate possibility. So I, I think it's okay. I, I don't think there needs to be a stigma attached to RBI explaining the letter. These have been very special circumstances yes. in which inflation has gone up. Uh, so it what what one needs to watch out is how credibly the central bank explains uh, why it has gone up, what it will do to bring it down. Uh, uh, so these are very critical uh, uh, next, next forecast. Okay. Uh, so it's okay if uh, inflation stays high into the next year, but that only means that the monetary policy needs to remain tight okay. for some time now. Fine. Point point taken entirely that uh, in. Special circumstances, stability is more important, financial stability, than perhaps uh, adhering to, uh, you know, uh, the, the targets that were set in more normal times. Uh, it's been a most enlightening discussion. Uh, Mr. Khara, uh, Prasanna, Samiran and Mridul Sagar, thank you very much for joining me. We wrap up on this special broadcast on the monetary policy.